Good morning. Please be seated. We are here for oral argument in cause number CV 170465 Halford Brown versus Violetta et al. And I apologize if I've mispronounced anybody's names. These proceedings are being video and audio recorded, so we ask counsel to please identify yourself and your client at the beginning of your argument. Each side will have 20 minutes. Appellant's counsel is responsible for watching the clock to reserve a portion of that time for rebuttal if desired. Also, we've read the briefs, we've conferenced the case, and are familiar with the facts and your arguments, so please use your time accordingly when you're ready, counsel. Good morning, Your Honors. If it may please the court, my name is Nasser Abushbara, and I represent appellant Stephanie Halford Brown. I think the best way to look at the issues faced on appeal is if we cut them in half and we look at what the judge the trial court allowed and what the trial court did not allow into evidence. And if we take what the trial court did not allow first, specifically quashing the subpoena of the out-of-state witness who was actually an agent of the defendants and disallowing a jury view, and if I may take them one by one. Mr. Weston, the safety expert for defendants, had moved to Florida. And following proper protocol, we got a subpoena issued from Arizona, sent to Collier County District. Hold on for a second, because I just want to make sure I understand what happened. You moved for uh, letters rocatory, correct? Yes, Your Honor. And um, it's my understanding that with that motion, you're actually asking to depose somebody in the state where they now reside. Isn't that, and they issue a subpoena telling the person they have to engage into a, to a deposition. Isn't that what happened here? You did a deposition, and I'm assuming you did it in Florida. Uh, no, Your Honor. You uh, did not do a deposition. It, it, early on in the case, there was a deposition of Mr. Weston. Here? Here. Okay. Mr. Weston moved to Florida. Mr. Weston. So were, were there additional areas you wanted to, to talk that's, to Mr. That's exactly Weston correct, Your Honor. It, it, his deposition happened early on in the litigation, before expert witness depositions, before other witness depositions. and he. He was their standard of care, for lack of a better word. He, he was the standard of care proof. He was the safety expert for defendants at the time this occurred. How many other people testified about that, the safety plan, the safety area, the safety zone? I think it was close to seven, wasn't many. it? Many. Yeah, and there, I don't think there's any argument we're making that there wasn't a lot of people that discussed the safety zone. I think the crucial difference between the individuals that, dis that actually testified and Mr. Weston was, on one hand, the individuals that testified was the bus driver and expert witnesses. Mr. Weston is essentially speaking for the defendant. So the weight of that testimony is, in the eyes of a jury, it's just simply not the same. But are you, are you saying you needed more, you needed an additional deposition that you were denied or? It I'm, I was taking from your pleadings that you wanted hear, him here to testify. That's what we, to, to take you back into the sort of timeline of, of how all this occurred, we initially set up a trial deposition is what occurred. And some issues happened in Mr. Wesson's life where he was not able to make that trial deposition. Is that here in Arizona or in Florida? In Florida. After that, we moved to have Mr. Weston appear at trial without any sort of. Can you give me your best case that says in a civil case, you can force a witness to, to come from one state to another state. In complete frankness, Your Honor, I don't have a single case. Not and that, one case. So we, if we issued a case agreeing with you, we would be the the lone wolf in in the country about for, saying you could come from one, you could force a witness to come from one state to another state in a civil case. I don't have a single case to the opposite. Um, the, there, there's obviously the federal cases that, that talk about this in terms of a 100-mile rule when it comes to the federal rules of civil procedure. I think the issue that we've had and what we're struggling with is what is the mechanism then? It seems as if there's sort of this, this vacuous area where essentially what the law, according to the trial judge, was that there simply is no way to compel the testimony of an agent of the defendant simply because he does not live in the well, state. But are you saying there's no way to get his deposition? That seems like a different question than can you force him to come to 
Arizona to testify. And if, if you can get his deposition and the parties agree that his further testimony is is not necessary, why wouldn't why, why would a court need to order him to come to Arizona? Because we were not allowed to take his trial deposition. And we were not allowed to. Let's talk about that, because that is not clear in the record. And what I found in the record was attached as Exhibit 1 to defendant's motion to quash the trial subpoena. And all I have is the request for the trial subpoena of Kent Weston. And attached to that is a subpoena in a civil case seeking to command him to appear in Maricopa County for a trial or hearing. When we talk about what exactly you did in Florida, it's not clear from the record. You requested letters rogatory, nothing in the record about what happened in Florida. Then we have this motion to quash. Now this motion to quash is to quash a trial subpoena, which you can see there is nothing that says that you can do that in a civil case. Am I correct? Yeah, yeah respectfully, Your Honor, I, I concede that there is nothing either way that tells me whether we can or cannot do it. Okay, so you gave it a shot and it was quashed, but you don't have anything to support the fact that you can do this in, in what you've conceded thus far is the 100 mile radius in federal court, right? It, correct, Your Honor, in answering, um, and I, I hate to mispronounce the name, Judge you McMurray's don't have name. To. Uh, th but you did it right. Thank you, there, there's, there's no case law, one way or the other, that talks about- There are rules? The, the statutory framework that when you, when you compare when you compare the Arizona statute for how to issue a subpoena, and then when you look at the Florida statute as well, and I, we, we detailed all this in our brief, so I, if. And, and what I want to see is the document. So you, uh, you talked about letters rogatory, which entitles you to a deposition, not an appearance in Arizona at trial, correct? From our understanding of the way Florida and Arizona. So uh, about 44 states at this point, are part of the Interstate Deposition and Discovery Act, correct, that discuss sort of how states talk to one another when it comes to this sort of thing. And I was, when we reviewed the statutes in Florida and in Arizona, how to compel a witness to testify at trial, I believe it's 1.13 in the Florida Civil Procedure, discusses that this is the manner in which to do it. So we got two issues here the trial subpoena that you issued and the request for deposition or further deposition of Mr. Watson. Weston, Weston, Weston. sorry. I've been watching too much Sherlock Holmes. Okay, <laughs> so we have these two different things. We've discussed the trial one. What happened to your ability to depose him in Florida or did you try? We tried. And I, what happened? I believe, and my memory is a little foggy here, that either he had some very significant health issues or his wife had some significant health issues. It was noticed, it was scheduled. I Was it rescheduled? It was not. Okay. Because there was no time, the, the time frame then, we we're talking about maybe two weeks before trial. You asked for a continuance based on the fact that he was unavailable. Of the trial, Your Honor? Yes. No. Okay, that's what I needed to know. It, a little unclear from the record. Please and, proceed. And my, my apologies about that. I, okay. it, to talk about some of the issues on, on why further deposition testimony was, uh, further testimony was necessary of Mr. Weston. Again, Mr. Weston's deposition was taken very, very early on in this trial, in this case. And he's not, you presumably have your own standard of care expert? We do. So why, why is his testimony critical? He, he wasn't a witness to, to what happened. So why, why would he be more significant or significant compared to your own standard of care expert? Thank you, Your Honor. In my opinion, the fact that he was the individual in charge of safety for the defendant. So he's not a paid expert. He's, he's the defendant's agent. This coming out of his mouth, what the actual standard of care is, what the safety guidelines are for the company, speaks mountains compared to what we can, uh, our paid expert is paid to say. But did you, depose, did you depose him on that? Very early on in the case, yes. And you had that? We did. And you presented it? We did. So what more so, did you need? Yeah. Later, as, as the litigation progressed, new evidence came to light regarding the actions of the plaintiff, the actions of the defendant, uh, the experts' opinions as to standard of care, all these issues that were not, we did not have the ability to ask Mr. Wesson about at his deposition. Are you just suggesting he would have agreed with your own expert that uh, regarding some issue on standard of care? 
That's our contention. Isn't that speculation? I think that you know. I, you're right, and I think that drives to the key point exactly. We don't know. But isn't and that we why were, you do discovery? Wouldn't wouldn't that be why you would challenge a refusal to participate in a deposition if he if you thought he was a, a critical witness? Why why wouldn't that be something resolved through discovery? By the point that we, we had thought that this trial deposition was going to go forward. So at that point, we figured we could, we could get every question answered, and that limited window. And, and again, I, I, I'm going to follow up on what Judge Campbell said, because when I was looking at it, I didn't see specifically where there was a denial of the trial deposition. I saw where the trial court said, no, I don't have authority to bring him back from Florida. But where specifically did you say, oh, by the way, we need, we need more trial deposition? Do you have a record citation for it where I can go and look at it? Counsel, I don't want you to waste your time. Thank you, Your Honor. During, dear, let's, in fairness, I could not find it. Okay, but during your rebuttal time, or you guys see if you can find something for us, please. Thank you, Your Honor. And if, if I may switch gears to the jury view aspect of this. It looks like there, the typical jury view motion is in a criminal setting, um, see the scene of a crime or things of that nature. And the the standard for which appellees would or defendants would like the court to issue a ruling in regards to a jury view is whether it substantially aids the jury. And I believe that is straight from the, the criminal case law, is that the substantial aid. If you look at the record, the judge, the trial judge made a ruling based on the possibility that it could lead to issues regarding a mistrial. The civil standard from the, is whether a jury view would be logistically difficult is the civil standard. I think the, the record shows that buses were paid for. It was eight miles away from the courthouse. It wouldn't have taken that long of time. This is not a typical red car, blue car type case. This case not only involves a bus accident at a bus stop, this is a layover stop. It's not your typical stop where you're going from one to the next to the next. Layover stop, <coughs> this bus driver stops here, has to go through three lanes of traffic to make a U-turn. The amount of photographs of the, uh, that, that can, Photographs that could depict that. There were some photographs. There were. It just. I, I think the the case law that I cited even states that no photograph would do, do it justice. Do the, the three D rendering of this. But a video. It's a great point, Your Honor. A video. A video would have. And did you present a video of what you were trying to get in the site visit? All the, the videos we were able to capture was about a two and a half minute window from the bus. That was the only video. Those, those are of the actual, the incident. Right. But I think what she's asking is if, could, couldn't you go and take a video of the scene if you just simply needed to show, if you thought there was something unusual that's not captured by photographs? Why, why schlep all of the, the jurors uh, somewhere what, what was so unique that couldn't be captured uh, photographically I guess is our question the I guess that that it's a, it's a death perception thing that when we're talking about cutting over these three lanes of traffic to get this idea in your head of what plaintiff's allegation is what this bus driver had to do in order to turn around there's really only one way to see it um, and it's actually to see it and it wasn't so it wasn't logistically difficult at all and I think that the standard in when, the case law states that if it wasn't logistically difficult. Wouldn't the best evidence be a video from the driver's position of a bus? So you see what the driver saw and then a video taken from the position of your client? Because you're not going to be able to do that at the scene with each and every juror. I guess I don't understand your question, Your Honor. I, 
Okay, you agree that you can play a videotape. Yes. And you agree that the scene is pretty much open to the public, so you could go there and take as many different videotapes as you wanted. Yes. And don't you think, rather than just going out and looking and saying, there's the sidewalk, here's the bus stop, if you had, say, created a video where the video camera is taping from the bus driver's perspective, and you could probably even rent a bus to do it, and then a videotape from your client's perspective. Do you see what I'm saying? I do. I think there might be some evidentiary issues involved there, that how can we th confirm that this is exactly where uh, the plaintiff was, where the bus sure. was. I think the issue, the jury view, the importance of the jury view is to give them the intersection, that because the the allegation was the conduct of the driver, how quickly he had to move out of there because he had to cross over this traffic. And, uh, and Your Honors, if we shift to the second part of sort of the, the main argument, we talked about what the trial court did not allow us to do. What the trial court, in my opinion, was even more egregious was the issues he brought, he allowed defendants to bring into evidence, specifically the glaucoma. Um, the, the defendant's argument is that the glaucoma goes to comparative fault. If it goes to comparative fault, there has to be some sort of causal effect. There has to be causation. There has to be proximate cause. There was not a single shred of med medical evidence, expert testimony, anything that talked about the fact that Ms. Halford Brown had issues with her glaucoma that would have led to her comparative fault. Um, Ms. Halford Brown testified. She said she had no issues. And that was it. But was there testimony that it did not impair her vision in any way? Her testimony was that she was at this, she uses this bus stop every day. This glaucoma never impacted her ability to see the bus, come after the bus, anything of the nature. And I think it's telling that in, in the uh, appellee's brief, they discussed that sort of this reasonable person standard, that you have to treat a reasonable person as that reasonable person is, and they use the example, simply an example, what would a reasonably blind person do? And I think there's a little bit of irony to that, because as soon as you allow this glaucoma testimony to be entered into evidence, immediately, all a jury is thinking is that this woman's blind. That's it. Her testimony about whether she could see, whether how it did not impact her, how she walked every day, how she saw the bus, all of that stuff is completely eradicated, because now they're thinking about a blind person. But why isn't that a credibility question for the jury to, to listen to her testimony and, and hear um, what she says about her vision, and if there is a diagnosis, why, why wouldn't that be something that the jury could take into account and weigh? Because they laid, they laid no foundation for the fact that this, that this led to her causing the accident herself. And without any sort of, it, it's just not relevant, without any sort of evidence to lead to get there. I, I thought a person's ability to perceive is always relevant if they're talking about I was at, I was so many feet from a bus, or I, I did this, or I did that, and they there have some type of an impairment. Whether you say it not impaired at all, or they're saying it was impaired to some degree, why isn't that always relevant in a jury question? Relevance, I, I, I guess the answer is relevance. You have to lay proper foundation for it to be relevant. And, and when they laid the rel the foundation trial transcript from April 26. Question, the bus is moving and you're running toward it still. I believe you mentioned yesterday that you're blind in your left eye. Correct, I am. Okay, and that's from a glaucoma condition. Correct, and you've had that condition since you were a teenager. Cor answer, yes. So the left side of you is facing the bus as you're running toward it. Correct. So you think the fact that she says that she is blind in her left eye, the bus is on her left side, and she's running toward it is irrelevant? Without any evidence from anyone that said that she could not perceive the bus because of her glaucoma. In closing, the exact quote from in closing, Your Honor, was, and we know about the glaucoma, we know about the left eye blindness, she is running blind. That is not accurate. She was not blind. One eye. She was unable to see out of her left eye. But able to see out of your, her right eye. And I think that there, there has to be, that's a, it, it's a huge distinction. But if you're, if you're in a car accident and you're blind in your left eye and you're, you're hit on the left side of the car, wouldn't, wouldn't that be relevant even though you can see out of your right eye? Why wouldn't 
peripheral vision be be relevant because there was no testimony from anyone that she could not see the bus but her own testimony that she can't see ever left eye so she knows the bus is there but it certainly affects her ability to perceive where how far away it is it would seem her own testimony was in fact your honor that she could she could see and she could perceive how close the bus was I'm gonna reserve if it's okay 31 seconds for rebuttal <laughs> thank you thank you your honors May it please the court. Good morning. My name is Todd Rigby. I represent the Appalese, uh, Veolia Transportation, and our bus operator, Kenneth Van Dyke. Uh, I represented them at trial, uh, as I represent them here today on appeal. And I am here on their behalf to ask that you affirm the jury trial verdict in their favor. This is a straightforward case. The jury heard all of the relevant evidence. The bus operator takes a designated break at a Tempe bus uh, stop for an extended period of time, and while doing so, leaves the front door open in case pedestrians want to board the bus. No one does. After he's done with his break, he decides that he's going to continue his route. He looks to his left for vehicular traffic, no immediate hazards. He looks to his right for pedestrian traffic on the sidewalk, no immediate hazards. Closes the door, proceeds forward, and only after the bus starts to move does the plaintiff, Ms. Halford Brown, who's sitting at the bus bench, get up and proceed toward the bus. First at a, at a walk and then at a run. As she runs with her left side toward the bus, um, she steps off the curb, onto the street, loses her balance. She's near the rear of the bus. It's as far as she ever gets. Um, and then the bus rear wheel makes contact with her foot, causing a pneumatic, it pinches her foot, causing a pneumatic tire injury. That's the case. The jury reviewed all of that evidence, deliberated, and then they addressed the first hurdle that Ms. Halford would have to face, as Judge Warner described in the jury instructions. That first hurdle is, did the bus operator breach any applicable standard of care? and the jury determined that he did not. And that's where it ended. They found, they, signing the first verdict form, finding in favor of the defendant. The evidence does support that verdict. And in short, once again, a very straightforward case, the evidence did show that this bus operator, after getting done with his break, did pay attention to a safety zone that's around the bus. We heard a lot about the safety zone. Paid attention to the safety zone to look for hazards. Didn't see hazards on his left side or his right side before he moved the bus. Could you explain the, your, your perspective on the request to have Mr. Weston testify or be deposed? Yes, Your Honor. Yes. The timeline is a little different um, than, than what we heard. Um, uh, and to opposing counsels, but uh, to be honest, I don't think he was part of, directly part of all of it, so it can get mixed up. But I was there for all of it. Um, well into the case um, is when the opposing counsel decided to depose uh, Mr. Weston. We did depose him out in Florida, not here. Um, during that time, opposing counsel very effectively questioned uh, Mr. Weston on multiple okay. facets of safety. And if you, so you do, was this before or after they moved for the letters rogatory? Before. So you generally deposed Mr. Weston. Was he a, an employee? He was at the, not. At that time, he was not an employee. Right. He was no longer an employee with Veolia at that time. He okay. was retired and living in Florida. Okay. Um, and I apologize. I don't have the exact time frame, but I know that that happened later in the case when discovery had been going on for some time, that we all went out to Florida and opposing counsel had asked uh, him questions, safety questions, especially with regard to the safety zone. And if it, my understanding in reading the briefs is that the reason they wanted Mr. Weston there, it, this all revolves around this safety zone, this 15 feet in front and back on the sides of the bus that Veolia recognizes and trains its drivers to recognize so that they look for hazards within that zone. And I think that's why they wanted Mr. Weston 
his testimony on that. They – Did they depose him on that in they his did. deposition? They went over it extensively. And by that time, they, they had all the documents that we had to give, the, uh, the Veolia safety manual um, uh, and related manuals and documents that discuss safety zones and things of that nature. Um, they had everything they needed to question him. Did they make a request to depose him a second time? Well, what happened first, they did, they did not throughout the course of discovery. Discovery ended, trial was set, they filed letters rogatory, um, and they wanted him to appear. Um, we argued that Judge Warner correctly decided that there was no authority to compel a Florida resident to come here, and only after, and I'm sorry, Your Honor. Yeah, because you filed a motion to quash, and that's what got me a little confused. So there's a letters rogatory, request for letters rogatory. Did the trial court grant that? And isn't that normally just for a deposition? Letters rogatory is for a deposition, not, right. for, not for a trial. Okay. I'm trying to figure out then the, the timeline of why then you, when did the subpoena issue and who issued the subpoena? If I remember, if I remember correctly, um, the subpoenas were issued by opposing counsel. Um, it was only after. They just, they just mailed him a trial subpoena? That is a good question, and I do not know the answer. To, I know that they subpoenaed him, and in all honesty, we weren't opposing. When they wanted to depose him, we, we didn't make, you know, we, we went along with him them in the course of discovery deposing him. But when they then uh, wanted him to appear at trial, we filed the motion to quash. When that was granted, um, then they asked for the trial deposition. Okay, well, let's back up, because I just, if I could, I don't mean to. You, there was a, a subpoena in a civil case that was attached to your motion to dismiss, um, and it's signed by Mr. Tonkin. And that's opposing counsel. Correct, and that's signed on signed on February first. And so, there, it, was there a Florida court that authorized a subpoena, a trial subpoena, or deposition? First deposition under the letters rogatory. Yes. Okay, and did that happen after the, so you've had your deposition, they filed for a letters rogatory, it's granted, Florida court issues a subpoena for a deposition, that deposition never happened? What happened, as opposing counsel explained, is that um, Mr. Weston's wife, uh, who had been sick with cancer, they had a family emergency, um, and he was unable to make it. Um, and this was shortly then before trial, there was no request for a trial continuance, and I don't want to go outside the record, but the bottom line is there was no further pursuit on opposing counsel's part to reschedule the deposition or uh, to continue the trial. And so we continued on. And, and, and so you know, the reason that we did continue on, and, and you've all touched on it, is because this zone, the safety zone, was addressed by multiple witnesses um, um, at various times throughout the trial is already discussed, um, Mr. Weston himself was deposed, and he became their first witness. They read the deposition in their case in chief right at the beginning. That included testimony on the safety zone. That came out right in the beginning. They also deposed our bus operator, Mr. Van Dyke, and talked about the safety zone. And this is very important, is that our bus operator conceded what they were asking. Yes, Veolia recognizes a 15-foot safety zone. Yes, they teach their drivers to recognize hazards within that. And yes, they taught me. It went beyond that. I mean, our bus driver does admit he didn't see her. He didn't see her at the bus stop. He was looking for hazards that were right alongside the bus. He didn't see her. Um, but he also explained that he was, uh, even though you're supposed to pay attention, to look for hazards in that 15-foot area, that doesn't mean that you have to focus on every single thing that's within there. Otherwise, you would never move the bus. And what he did is, when he looked in that area, he determined there were no hazards, closed the door, moved forward. Um, so that was addressed by two witnesses. But beyond that, judges, I can believe you brought up, there was also a standard of care expert that they had, uh, Mr. Herbert, who took the testimony of Mr. Weston, Mr. Van Dyke, our safety manual provisions. And he spent a good part of the trial talking about safety zones and related issues. And in his opinion, how our bus operator fell below the standard of care because he did not sufficiently follow that, that safety rule. So 
It was covered extensively at trial. Um, so we, we believe that Judge Warner was correct in the first instance in not uh, requiring um, this witness to fly out from Florida. But even if he was, there was no prejudice because it was addressed on many levels through many sources. Same with the jury view. Jury view um, can be helpful in certain cases, especially if the condition itself is important and is in dispute. Well, first things first, Judge Warner was correct in determining that there were problems, um, potential problems that could happen in a jury view. Um, and we addressed this not once but twice, first in motion practice and then at the trial, the final trial conference when opposing counsel brought it up again for clarification, and we went through it all again, and we brought up a number of potential problems that could happen, um, you know, based on possible inappropriate uh, or inappropriate um, uh, interrelationships between the jurors out in this foreign setting or with opposing counsel or with Ms. Halford, who might be there. Is that inherent in any type of uh, it, view? It can be, and it, but it's something to consider. It's, it's, that's always on the con part of it, true. But beyond that, in this case, this was an accident that had happened four years prior, where conditions were not necessarily the same, where that area was no longer controlled by this particular bus company because it now belongs to another bus company. Um, so the conditions were different. The bus itself was not going to be out there. There's no way to put them together for reenactment. <coughs> and, and Judge, I believe you brought this up. What would have been very uh, advantageous for them to do? Do their own video. Well. In essence, they did. They had their own engineering expert. His name was Mr. Cannon. And he went out there and during discovery took photographs, videos, and set up a grid, plotted points all over that for just the same 3D effect that opposing counsel was talking about. Set everything out so that he could show a jury how everything was laid out. And he presented all of that at trial. Ironically enough, it wasn't really necessary because there was no real dispute about the configuration. Our client had already admitted that he was in the bus and that the bus bench was within the 15-foot safety zone, admitted, and we did throughout the course of the trial, admitted that the, the bench was, was, was within the safety zone and that, there, um, that uh, there was visibility. There were no visibility obstructions. So the bus driver would have been able to see. Had he looked directly in that area, he could have seen some part of her or the bench. None of that was in dispute. So jury view in this particular case would end up with more problems than solutions. There was absolutely no prejudice. And they had what they needed. Most importantly, the jury themselves and all the questions that they asked, their focus wasn't on the configuration or the layout. They had plenty of evidence on that. It really was just the interaction between the bus and the pedestrian. When did the pedestrian get up? When did the bus start to move? How far did the pedestrian make it? All of that is captured in a bus video that looks from the inside out the, out the right side. It shows her when she's sitting there. It shows when the doors close. It shows when the, when the bus starts to move. It shows when she gets up and starts toward the bus. All of that was on videotape. All of that was shown to the, the jury. So that's jury view. Glaucoma was also made an issue. I, I will say this, when it comes to glaucoma, and the uh, subsequent motor vehicle accident, the, the two other substantive issues in this case, they're really moot points. Because as I explained in the beginning, the jury in this case tackled that first hurdle. Plaintiff's burden of proving that the bus operator failed uh, in his standard of care. And when they made a determination that he did not breach that standard of care, they found in defendant's favor. There was no reason to go into comparative negligence or go into causation or damages. Doesn't glaucoma have more relevance than just comparative fault in this case? I, I think mean, it goes to it goes to perception. Uh, all of those things have absolutely nothing to do with comparative fault. I, I, I agree 100 percent, but it, it, it goes to her perception. Not to, the bus, not to the bus operator's perception, and, and I agree with you. But all I'm saying is the jury made its decision in, that, in finding that, they, that the bus operator did not deviate from his standard of care. They looked at his actions. His, they put him in the reasonable person. But aren't, aren't they considering at the same time that this, if they're, if they're let's say they unfairly thought she was 100% blind, um, 
wouldn't that affect their decision on whether the bus driver was negligent? I think it's fair to say that no one, no jury ever looks at the facts in a vacuum. I, I think that's fair. Were they confused on this point? No. Um, in this particular case, as you can see from the record, first of all, we did not make it the cornerstone of our defense. It was a factor. That's what it was meant to be. It was just a factor to consider. Um, and uh, no, the way the jury verdicts were, were read to them and the way Judge Warner explained it to them, um, that their first order of business was to look to see, is the bus operator at fault? And then you move on. Um, in terms of prejudice, maybe because it's not in a vacuum, fair enough, was there any prejudice to, the, to this? There really wasn't because, first of all. I understand your argument as to the subsequent accident, that that would only become relevant. But the, the glaucoma seems, seems like your better argument is simply that's relevant to the overall circumstances of what happened. And her perception is, is not something you can just ignore if she's visually impaired on that side. And I agree with you. I, I agree with you. I think I'm getting caught up on the procedural part of it, or should we even look at it? But you're, you're, you're exactly right. As a practical matter, yes, it goes to perception. It is relevant. Um, uh, and as was previously discussed, when you look at a reasonable person, you look at that reasonable person according to the restatement based on their physical characteristics, whether they're totally blind or whether they're blind in one eye. Um, and it is a factor. It is a factor if she is running toward the bus with the bus to her left side and she's acknowledged through her own testimony that she's blind in her left eye. So we believe that it's relevant. I just want to make the point too that it's, it, it's not prejudicial. Uh, the subsequent accident, if I can just touch on that briefly, we did stay within the parameters despite the allegations made by opposing counsel. We focused on that subsequent accident not to talk about how much money she got from it or to, to dwell on, on the injuries that she had from that. We focused on that in the timeline of her pre-accident condition, after our accident, and then uh, what she did after our accident, and then this subsequent accident. And what happened was we saw she worked full time after our accident, and she worked there for Cigna. Um, and yet her doctors, and uh, some of her experts were testifying, there's no way that she can work on a full-time basis. So all we wanted to do was point out, well, wait a second, she did work full-time after our accident, and she only stopped working there after she was involved in this subsequent accident. And that's just the way the facts went. Uh, and that's what we did there. Uh, I will say, just to touch briefly on the Rule 68 sanctions, there might be some confusion there, um, because it's really not much in dispute. Uh, in the lower in the trial court, uh, after the verdict was rendered, uh, we submitted our statement of costs. They objected to certain ones. We sat down. We withdrew a number of them, um, and inclu including many that were brought up in in their brief. So the judge Warner, when he granted the costs, they did not include those disputed costs, other than one item, and that is our standard of care expert from Texas, David Stopper, his travel expenses which had to do with um, his travel time, airplane, hotel, rental car. It's about $3,000, $3,500. So unless I'm mistaken, that's all that, that's, at, that's at issue on that final argument. Um, and we would say that, first of all, he was a key witness. Um, he is the uh, witness who explained to a jury that our driver did comply with the applicable standard of care um, throughout this and we believe those, reason, uh, those expenses to be reasonable. And we ask that, they, that, that judgment for, their, for those costs to be awarded. And in, the, in conclusion, Your Honor, I, I thank you all for your time on this. And I do once again ask on behalf of my clients that you affirm the judgment in their favor from the trial court. Thank you. Thank you. And before we start the timer, did you find the reference to the place in the record where your client requested um, the deposition in Florida? I think that was your question. Well, no, but what I did find, Your Honor, was if you, um, in the record, plaintiff's amended response in opposition to defendant's motion to quash the subpoena as an exhibit is the trial subpoena signed by the Florida court. Thank so you. That's, that's in the record. Wonderful. Please proceed. Let's see how much I can blabber in 30 seconds. Um, <laughs> Ready, go. Thank you. So th really quickly, the, there's no 
dispute that the bus stop is exactly as it was four years ago. There was, there was never a dispute there. And just to go back to this perception issue one last time, if you, the entire record of Ms. Halfords Brown's direct testimony talks about her being able to use a cell phone, her being able to go towards the bus left side all the time. There's never any contradicting evidence at all. I think they had to lay the proper foundation to be able to bring that to the jury. And it's almost like we're going to punish her for being disabled without any proof. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, counsel, we will take this matter under advisement and issue a written opinion in due course. We thank you for your arguments.